three subjects. So why did now he spend three years to put integration theory, and it needs to be expanded in uh, other world foundations. Um, so Edmund London will go into theory foundations. Then the main application of uh, time dependent perturbation theory is interaction of magnetic radiation with uh, matter. And uh, Patricia Stephen Hadassah will uh, cover this subject, either telling how the interaction is arranged or giving more details of uh, what is electromagnetic radiation at, from, as far as chemists must know. And uh, the three uh, presentations called up to completion of, of the session, Max Lowe and, and David, will cover how do the discoveries, observations, predictions of time dependent perturbation theory are changed if one takes into account the thermal equilibrium, or at least uh, bring our bring this factor into our attention, the thermal equilibrium is everywhere in the uh, real world. So, um, okay, um, I'm going to be talking about foundations. Uh, one of the two foundational talks. I'm going to be talking about the three pictures. Of quantum mechanics. So that would be the Schrodinger picture, the Heisenberg picture, and uh, the interaction picture, uh, which is kind of a neat, uh, almost combination of them. Uh, uh, combines uh, certain aspects. So uh, the Schrodinger uh, picture, we know this guy. Um, I think it was like 1926 or something. Uh, good friend Erwin whipped this bad boy up. Um, and uh, what's what's unique about it is that uh, in the context of these three pictures is that uh, the state vectors are actually uh, what get involved. Um, so th the operator itself, um, here I have the time evolution operator. Uh, this guy can be represented by U uh, U U T or something um, uh, used before. Um, but uh, that is um, what acts on uh, the initial state uh, and causes the uh, state function to change over time. Um, so we have our time evolution operator uh, established there. Uh, thanks, Schrodinger. Uh, the Heisenberg picture is a little bit different. Uh, now, instead of the state function changing with time, uh, now we see the operator that is the one um, that is time dependent. So uh, I have a few equations up here. Um, we have an observable A, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the observable for the Heisenberg picture uh, can be defined by that um, expectation value. Uh, and so um, yeah, eventually we get this uh, operator right here. Um, it is going to be acted on by, uh, I guess, the inner product with the time evolution operator, as we learned earlier. Um, and if we differentiate that, we can see exactly how uh, that um, observable will change with time. And so, um, as the first uh, equation implies, uh, the initial state of the Schrodinger uh, wave function or state function uh, will be what we expect to be the Heisenberg uh, wave function. So sort of as a combination of those two, um, we have the interaction picture. And so instead of one part being stationary, that being the state function or the observable, uh, instead both of them uh, can change with time. So, oh, it's still on Heisenberg. Oh, yeah, I got the slide again. Yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay. And this one is, uh, this is pretty applicable to what we've been learning. This is actually exactly uh, what we've been learning uh, in lab yesterday, especially. Um, 
But uh, instead of having our Hamiltonian um, just being described by a uh, single term, instead we're going to uh, split it up into two terms uh, using perturbation theory. So the zeroth order and the first order uh, are going to be the combination which makes up the energy of the system. And when we have um, when we have those two things, um, we primarily are going to look at how the uh, zeroth order uh, self commutes. And so, if we look at the first uh, perturbation Hamiltonian for the interaction, um, we see that it's um, it evolves pretty similarly to the operators that we've seen in uh, previous slides. So given that uh, we have this term, uh, that's what we actually use uh, as the interaction term. Um, if we have a wave function that rotates, um, we want to describe it by like a cosine function. I have some notes on this, but um, I'll spare you the, the fine details. This will be what we end up with. This is exactly what we see in the MATLAB code. Um, uh, it's going to be uh, exponentials in the off diagonals of the uh, matrix instead of the uh, on diagonal. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's it. Okay, please join. There you go. Okay. Um, so, uh, what we're basically going to be doing is expanding our wave function in terms of a orthonormal basis, like we always do, because it makes everything way easier. And so blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to basically skip this because we've already done all this stuff before. It's just there for the sake of internal consistency. Um, ultimately, that gives us, oops, whoa. I can't see anything. Yeah, OK, so that is equivalent to uh, just solving for these time-dependent expansion coefficients. and. Uh, they will look something like this, where this is our perturbing potential. Um, and so, with that in mind, we will build our perturbation theory. So, um, this is just that same equation, just there so that you can look at it again. Um, uh, we're just going to simplify notation a little bit because uh, this is going to be way too big to keep writing over and over again. So, yeah, we're just calling B sub Kn, basically K bra n ket. Uh, sandwiching our perturbing potential in there. And then omega Kn is just the energy difference over h bar. So that just compresses this thing to i omega, uh, I omega t. So, so I'll get this out so it can work. Well, sure. Um, so keeping this is that same equation again, just you know, in terms of our new variables. Um, if we assume that we start purely in some state m and that our perturbation is small enough that this guy is changing kind of smallly uh, or slowly, um, then these cn's will just be delta n m, right? It's zero unless we're in state m, which is the state that we're starting in purely. So then that expansion coefficient is just one, everything else is zero. So uh, that means that these are all either zero or one. So the sum goes away and we just get the M term here, right? And so this is our first order uh, derivative of our expansion coefficient. So if we just do the time integral on both sides, this is our, uh, just the actual expansion coefficient itself. And so that will let us write our wave functions. Oh, okay, that worked. Um, okay, so keeping these things in mind here, we already just found those. Um, to get to second order, what we do is we take this expression and we plug it in there, right? Uh, so then you do that, you get this whole thing, and then you can kind of simplify that down a little bit because um, this delta is going to only leave this term here as far as this is concerned. And then we're going to be adding on, you know, all this other stuff at the end. So. This thing does not work very well. Okay, so now we've got our 
second order term here, right? And we can integrate this thing. It's kind of gross looking or whatever, but it's easy enough to actually do. There's nothing too crazy complicated. It's just a lot. So here's our second order expansion coefficients um, solved explicitly as a function of time, right? And so then what we can do is we can just keep doing this over and over again, right? Like we can just keep, like we've got this expression now, so we can plug this back in uh, into like the, um, into this expression, right? So like every time we get a higher order, we just take that, plug it back in there, right? So to get to second order, you plug this one in. To get to third order, you take your second order, plug it in there, right? You just keep doing this over and over again. And so to get to infinite order, uh, we're going to need to compress our notation a little bit because uh, you can see that this is already getting to be a lot to write down over and over again. So <clears throat> we're going to define this V sub I. And this is what that is, right? You're just sandwiching your uh, your potential in between uh, two exponentials of like positive and negative sign. Um, and this basically turns out that uh, this expression here, right, which keeps showing up everywhere, that guy just simplifies down to this right here. So that's kind of why we're doing that. And then, okay, so if we look at our second order expression, um, you can see that that basically, uh, we can just rewrite that as, you know, broad and kept between K and M, right, because that's just our delta function then. Uh, you've got this thing showing up, right? You got this one and then another one showing up and yeah, blah, blah, blah. We can pull all the, the bras out to the left and we can pull all these M kets out to the right because every term has one of those. And so inside of our brackets here, we've got this whole thing, right? And you kind of see like zeroth order, first order, second order, you kind of see what's going on here. Um, but this is still going to be a little bit difficult to deal with, so we need to simplify it a little bit more. Uh, so this is just that same equation again, just so you can see what's happening here. Um, so this sum, we can just move it inside here, right? Because none of this stuff depends on n. It's just these guys that depend on n right here, right? And so this guy, as it turns out, is just one. Uh, and this is just me proving that really quickly. Where is it? There we go. Uh, yeah, this is me convincing myself that that is actually the case. Um, not really the point of what we're talking about here, but okay. So if we're looking at this expression here, right, this thing just drops down to one, right? And as we keep expanding and adding more terms, you can kind of see how we're going to get these V's and we're going to get these like a N ket and an N bra in between our V's. And so we're, we're ultimately going to have like a sum, you know, ends, V, ends, V, ends, until eventually we get to this M cat. Uh, so those are all just going to disappear as one. And so that will allow us to expand to higher order terms, right? So we've got like zero, first, second, blah, 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 up to nth order. You can kind of see the pattern here, right? Like we're going to get N as an exponent here. We're going to be taking N integrals, and we're going to get N of these Vs. And so... If we keep going, ultimately, we will be able to do infinite order perturbations, and that will give us a, uh, an exact solution. Um, but we're still going to need to have a way to deal with that. And so uh, the way that people do that is with the Tyson time ordering operator. So if you've got this thing acting on like operators A and B that are both dependent on time, what this is going to do is it's going to be in this order when T1 is bigger than T2. And it's going to flip it when T1 is smaller than T2. And so if we look at this expression here, because these are going to keep showing up, um, we can basically, right, you're just doing two of these integrals, right? And you've just got your T and T prime. So that's going to, right, when this one is bigger than this one, then we're going to be in this case here, right? When this one is bigger than this one, we're going to get this integral over here. Um, and as requested, we have the picture of sort of like the integration boundaries, right? So this is that integral on the left. This is like the region that we're integrating. Oh, that's weird. It cut off the, uh, this should be T prime. 
uh, and this point is T. Like this axis is T prime, this point is T. Um, but anyway, when T1 is bigger, right, or T prime, sorry, that's this region. When T double prime is bigger, that's this region. So this is that left integral, this is that right integral. And so, uh, basically, this part I didn't really understand, but uh, it's, supposedly you can do that. Um, you basically just do that, flip stuff around, and so then both of your integrals become equal. So you've just got two of those things, right? So now we know that this is just equal to that, and we can generalize that to uh, any arbitrary power that we want, right? Uh, so that'll turn into n factorial here, right? We're going to get uh, n of these integrals. And we're going to get n of these v's exactly how it was showing up in our arbitrary order perturbation theory. So now we can take this limit to infinity and actually explicitly solve for it. Um, and it looks like this. And notice that this expression right here, uh, where these are all like, you know, subscript L, right? This is just an exponential. Uh, th this is like the definition of an exponential function. So then ultimately, we just have our bra, our ket, and an exponential of a thing that we can explicitly solve for. And that is how you do infinite order perturbation theory. OK. So I realized that I forgot to put my name and stuff on my first slide. So for those online, I'm Tori, and I'll be presenting the opinions of light to matter and Newtonian. This is pretty much just the stuff needed to actually not actually doing any whole project. All right, so that's just a little what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to skip that and go into some definitions. So uh, first thing that we need to know before we forget to say anything else is what exactly is the electric field, and, uh, magnetic field, and vector potential. So electric field is a vector field created by the attraction and repulsion of electrical charges of particles and is usually measured in volts per meter and the intensity of the field decreases with the distance from the source. So if you have a particle here with a plus charge, um, all around it will have the electric field that is going away from it towards a negative ion. Um, that is also the equation that is usually thought of with electric field. Uh, after some math, this will get cut down a little bit, and I will not show the math just due to time. But magnetic field is a vector field that describes the ma magnetic influence on moving electric charges, so electric currents and magnetic materials. So pretty much if you had that charge that I was talking about earlier and put it in a magnetic field, it will react in a different way than it would if it was just an electronic field itself. And then a vector potential is a vector field uh, so distributed in space as to represent means of its curl uh, from physical important vectors. So pretty much, let's say I have a vector pointing upwards. Um, the vector potential would be pretty much oscillating all around it. So that's what it means by curl. It's the curl of whatever that particular important vector is. Does that makes sense? Um, Later on, we will have to construct a potential representation of both the electric field and magnetic field. And to do that, we do need to put it um, as vector potential and a scalar potential. So you can kind of see it in this first equation. So A would be your vector potential, and then B would be your uh, scalar potential. So we kind of have to do that for all of them. That's not the right one. There it goes. All right. So you also need to know what exactly a gauge is. So from what I could tell, a gauge is a constraint that allows you to uniquely describe an electromagnetic wave. So um, it can. So originally, electromagnetic wave can be written with six different values. So the x, y, and z of both the electric and magnetic field. After you uh, write it as a potential representation instead, it gets us down to four variables, a x, a y, a z, and also b. But this by itself is also not very unique. So you need a gauge constant to actually make it unique for the particular thing you are interested in. 
So um, yeah, to make it unique to the way that you're looking at. For electrostatistic, we normally think of the field being related to the electrostatic potential through, um, through energy, the electron potential equals negative uh, partial derivative of potential vector, so A, uh, with B attached. But for a field that varies in time and in space, the electrodynamic potential must be expressed in both terms of um, the vector potential A and B. So with some math, And with using um, Coulomb's gauge, which makes it so B equals zero, mm -hmm. we get this for our electric potential and this for our magnetic potential. So now we need to have an actual wave equation for our potential vector. So this is the one that what I was reading that always kept popping up. And then this vector potential gives a plane wave solution for charge in free space with boundary conditions. So that's where that one is. And then uh, this is just me explaining what K is because K is a wave vector itself. So um, once you have this and you actually plug it into this equation for magnetic field, you will see that the wave vector plus the, the, um, the electrodes, the electric field um, polarization unit, which is this E will equal zero, which makes it that it's perpendicular to each other. Now with that, you can get the, Using this equation, my apologies, you can get the vector potentials and obtain um, the electric, uh, yeah, the electric, I'm sorry. <laughs> Brain is going black. The, the electric field and magnetic field values themselves, which with math gives you this and this at the end of those. Um, And then the wave has an amplitude, which is A, that is directed along the polarization unit vector K. So that also helps with why they are perpendicular to each other for this part. Okay. And it's missing from this slide. Okay, so we know the angle is to show that uh, the vector the electric, magnetic, and magnetic field are all perpendicular to each other. And to do that, so far we have not come up with a vector for the magnetic field. So we do that and we get, as I, it should have been on there, I must have deleted on accident. With some math, you get this for your vector to the magnetic field. And then from this, you can see that the magnetic field vector is perpendicular to this part. So because um, the electric vector is perpendicular to the wave, uh, the wave vector, it will come out where they are all orthogonal to each other, creating this and that's all I have. Okay. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I can put my name for the purpose of people online. It's Patricia. So I'll be talking on um Atom and matter interaction for all time dependent perturbation theory. 
and I'll be focusing on the semi-classical Emotonian, the criteria for small field and momentum representation and dipole approximation. Um, the lines and matter interaction is one of the applications of time-dependent perturbation theory. It is commonly used in the concept of spectroscopy. Um, I know um, that's how it's related to chemistry. Um, the Hamiltonian of the interaction, sorry. The Hamiltonian of the interaction is called semi-classical because the radiation, the uh, electromagnetic field is treated uh, classically while the energies of the atom is treated quantumly. Uh, we shall analyze the, we're going to be talking about the interaction and having information about the interaction will give us more uh, in-depth knowledge about um, the magnetic dipole, the um, electric quadrupole, sorry, electric quadrupole, I guess, and the study of selection rules. We can also use this information to study the absorption, uh, the induced emission of radiation, uh, which I think David will be talking about. <clears throat> okay, as shown previously in um, the slide where uh, we could talk about I shown previously in Teresa where she also gave a picture of this um, this graph that shows the electric fields and the magnetic fields on the plane wave uh, with the vector k. I know my vector is not there, but it's supposed to be a facing. Okay, it's supposed to be facing the x-axis. It's supposed to be facing the x-axis. So. For, for horse to get a maximum okay we for horse to get like we uh, Jerry talked about gauge what a gauge is in our previous slides and she emphasized that for her to uh, get that, I think she spoke about for us to be able to get the one that is most convenient for us to make our calculations easier, we can, uh, our gauge could be anything uh, we want it to be to make our calculations easier. So for our light and matter interactions for this particular uh, study, we're going to be picking a reference frame for our gauge in which our um, in which our scalar potential is zero. If you could remember Tori's slide when she was given uh, the equation for uh, the interaction, I think she gave both the vector potential and the scalar potential in which for our interaction is zero. The vector potential is also given there, which is the same as the one she said and the electric fields and the uh, magnetic fields in which we can get by the interaction of our matter and field. So <clears throat> when our matter and light interact, we're supposed to get an Hamiltonian, which looks like the one on the board. So uh, the last time, uh, before I could finally come up with this uh, Hamiltonian, I saw a lot of uh, Hamiltonian with uh, different um, Hamiltonian, different concepts of Hamiltonian. But I think I went with this because I got it from a textbook, uh, Cohen. And this Cohen shows what was actually different from this Hamiltonian and the other ones I've been seeing online because uh, Cohen showed the last term, which represent the electron spin magnetic moment with a plane wave oscillating magnetic field. Others did not show it. Others just showed um, without it. 
So uh, this could be simplified into our total Hamiltonian, which is equals to our unperturbed and our perturbed Hamiltonian, which the perturbed is the familiar one we know, the potential plus the kinetic energy, and the unperturbed is, and the interacting is given by this. Once you expand this uh, Hamiltonian figure, you have um, something that looks like something that looks like this. You have it here. And so it said that with ordinary light source in which we're familiar with the intensity is low so that the effect of uh, A, sorry, this is a mistake, A naught square is negligible, is negligible compared to the, compared to A naught. So this term is all gone. And um, this, uh, sorry, this equation here, I don't know why, I was still trying to get why they commute because they were not supposed to commute uh, the uh, vector potential and the, um, yes, the vector potential and the momentum. I saw that when it was used in the textbook, they added up together. I, I actually don't know why they added up together, but they did in some other, textbook I saw that one was uh, um, like one I think one of the p a was equated to zero but in this particular one they said it commute so I it was a textbook I just went with it and so you have the Hamiltonian which is uh, uh, reduced to this concept and the perturbation was also splitted into the one that uh, has a spin um, moments and the one without, just for. Um, okay, so I think I've talked about this. So in an electromagnetic wave, the says the A is oscillating sinusoidally in space, which is given by this equation. So the said A is easier to manipulate when it is an exponential. So I gave, this is the same thing as this, but it's an uh, exponential. And the corresponding perturbative electric field is given by this. It was also noticed that the uh, magnetic field was thrown away. I was wondering, they said it doesn't really matter. Everybody keeps saying it doesn't really matter. So because here I could see that emphasis were only made on the electric field. So as I said earlier, if you restrict ourselves to just visible lines, uh, we have this equation, E to be this from that equation. And the K term could be very negligible because comparing this is wrong, sorry. Comparing, or I think I messed up something here. Comparing the wavelength of visible light, the wavelength of visible light to the wavelength of the orbital is very small. So the K term could be very negligible. That's why the K term was removed. So that's how we have the value of the perspective electric field to be this. So this is what is called the dipole approximation whereby the, uh, the electric field of the visible light is um, um, so large compared to the uh, wavelength of the uh, atom, so it's negligible. And that's where we come to the electric dipole approximation, where we ignore all special variation of E and only consider the terminal temporal oscillation. We can write a perturbative Hamiltonian to use the electric field in terms of potential A and in E instead of the potential A. And this would give us a final answer. And this was also, I said this was derived the first year of the Scalene's group. So I didn't need to write it how to get from your uh, electric field to your, um, from your potential to your electric field, we've done it in class. So, and you can also use, change it to your exponential figure. So for the using the Taylor series. All right, so I'll be discussing the 
units of the light and shadow So this is the exact way that we can measure all of those different values that we've seen in presentations so far. The computer's like inside of that cabinet, so it's just, yeah. <laughs> it was working earlier. It should be. Maybe it is. Just there when the keyboard is more reliable. There probably oh, oh, oh. So, first we talk about the light matter coupling and also the long wave like approximation, which I was also asked to discuss. So, we have our uh, long light matter coupling Hamiltonian equation up there. And importantly, these two exponentials in the situation in which uh, we're working with a single molecule and not a large polymer, we have something called the long wavelength approximation where uh, since it's not a polymer, you would have to have an absolutely gigantic organic molecule in order to ever even reach the uh, size of a X-ray wavelength. And so we can expand out those two uh, exponentials in terms of K and RJ, which are units uh, related to the size of our molecule into a, a power series. And these both converge into one, so we can simplify that. And that we will find that uh, K in RA is less than one. And that's uh, uh, the, the contingent that the long wavelength approximation relies on, is that those are less than one, and so it converges. Moving on to electric dipole. So I think it's called a NAMBLA is when it's inverted. Oh yeah, yeah, NAMBLA. So we, we mapped our equation from slide one to account for our energy and our uh, Hamiltonian equation. And working through all of that, uh, it simplifies out into finding that we have mu here is equal to the sum of our units and burning through these slides kind of fast. But this is uh, the the slide that led to a quite vigorous uh, hour long discussion uh, this morning while I was trying to prepare this. So we have mu, which is said to be our electric dipole uh, operator. Now we can find various other things for finding our electric dipole moment, you know, units of electric field, but it uh, entirely rests on one condition. Is mu the same thing as Q? In several textbooks and sources, you will see the equation that uh, P, Q, D, where D is our uh, vector of our electro electromagnetic field, relying on a uh, operator Q. Is Q the same as mu? <laughs> I say that Q is the same as mu, and in which case we can uh, our internal energy then is equal to negative P times our electric field, which is the same as our uh, electron electron electronic dipole moment operator times our electric field. That product is also equal to our internal electricity, our internal energy. And given that the uh, electron, the electron electronic operate, dipole operator should be a constant, or at least always the same. Electron electric. The elect is it the electron electronic dipole operator. For the electronic operator, the electronic dipole operator of a single electron should always be the same relative to the strength of the electric field. I would argue in the classical picture, yes, in the quantum picture, no, I think. The, the source I got that from explicitly said that in the quantum picture, if it's wildly different from what it should be, that means that you're going backwards in time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yes, that, that took up quite a lot of time this morning was arguing about that. And I'll just keep moving. And for reference, what it should be is that uh, the dipole moment 
uh, in terms of Coulomb's meters is one over the speed of light C times 10 to the negative 21st power, which is the Debye for the atomic scale uh, unit of dipole energy as Coulomb's meters is far too large for anything. And moving on to uh, momentum, we have uh, a different P, P hat is equal to negative I H bar uh, partial differentiation respect to X, inputting our uh, psi operator. We did that part in class. But it works too is that in all cases, uh, the momentum is just negative h bar times your vector in a given direction. And now this is probably the topic I know the least about because I had the least amount of time to go even. Uh, but in this case, we've uh, discussed in class, our final uh, important, most important finding is that uh, we can use our vector potential as a first order permutation correction onto our Hamiltonian with this equation down here of di a a di is the S current uh, formula to fit to the first order approximation that follows from the Gordon rule. Yes, sorry. Who's doing anything? Okay. Okay, so. All right, I'll be presenting on the second order quantization of the vector potential and light matter interaction Hamiltonian. So uh, let's unpack those terms a little. So um, first order quantization, what is that? Um, that's pretty much we've, what we've been dealing with so far this semester. When you see a Schrodinger equation and whatnot. So you have a um, semi-classical treatment of quantum mechanics where you treat particles as quantum wave functions in the environment is treated classically, sort of like what was talked about earlier with the electromagnetic field being treated classically. Um, and the vector potential we've seen so far is um, in terms of this first order quantization. It gets to be called the first order because it was the first uh, convention made up um, for quantum mechanics by Schrodinger, Dirac, and Heisenberg. Um, Second order uh, means that we are going to write our quantum mechanical terms in terms of creation and annihilation types of operators. Um, second order quantum mechanics, second order quantization usually gets applied to uh, many body quantum mechanics, aka quantum field theory. Um, and you get equivalent results to the first order. It's just another way of representing it and can be useful um, in other contexts. Uh, and just so we know what we're going to end up getting, here's our vector, second order vector potential in terms of. Uh, creation annihilation operators. Um, so a dagger for creation, just regularly for um, annihilation operators. So just review, um, you may have seen creation annihilation operators in a qu earlier quantum mechanics course. I'm not sure what the phys quantum mechanics one is in phys or physics. I'm not sure what it is for chemistry. Um, but if you have the problem of a harmonic oscillator, um, we get there's this one representation with the momentum and the Order representation. You can represent it as second ordered uh, quantization Hamiltonian in terms of these creation and annihilation operators. And um, the advantage of representing it like this is that it's uh, very easy to manipulate. You can use a uh, creation operator acting on some end state, which represents an nth vibrational mode. It will create or it will add on to another vibrational mode plus some factor. The annihilation operator will remove some sort of vibrational mode. And you can represent your position and momentum in terms of these creation and annihilation operators. So um, how do you go to this, at least with a simple harmonic oscillator from this first and second quantized language? Um, first, you have to identify your canonical coordinates, which would be position and momentum from your Hamiltonian. Uh, you'd rescale them to be some normal coordinates. This is for mathematical convenience. Um, you identify commutation relations because we are dealing with um, quantum mechanical operators. Commutation is very important. 
uh, then you can represent your Hamiltonian in terms of these normal coordinates. And then you do some more mathematic manipulations to figure out what your creation and annihilation operator should be, uh, which we represent on the previous slide. And then you can show your Hamiltonian in terms of this creation and annihilation operators. So um, how can we get that for the light matter interaction? Um, so we know that electromagnetic waves are um, oscillating waves. Um, so uh, with the simple harmonic oscillator, we have oscillations. Um, we can get some analogous ideas here. As we'll see, we can recast the Hamiltonian to look like a um, simple harmonic oscillator kind of solution. Um, some, some things that are different, uh, instead of having the position and momenta be our canonical coordinates, our scalar potential actually takes the place of the x coordinate and then you have momenta. Um, the scalar vector, the vector potential and the momenta do have a commutation relation. Um, and then we can represent our light matter interaction Hamiltonian um, in terms of this vector potential. And you also do a Fourier transform to have it in terms of this uh, wave vector. So that puts it in a form that's useful for when we do this um, uh, tra transition from the first to the second quantized language. So um, from there, um, some, some other things that are different from about the process. Um, before, when you have the uh, simple harmonic oscillator, your mo lowest mode you can have is zero, and then you can just keep increasing from there for light matter interaction. Uh, since your wave can propagate forward and backward, uh, we have to compensate for that for the wave number k being positive or negative. Um, in this case, your creation annihilation operators will create states um, that have k wave numbers or and such. And um, we can represent our um, scalar uh, or, or, or vector potential a and our momenta in terms of these creation annihilation operators um, like before we could for position of momentum. And once we do that, um, we can now represent our Hamiltonian um, since it ended up being recasted as a superharmonic like solution. Um, as like so, this is our second quantized language. Um, and again, I'm repeating the, the second quantization vector potential, which again has these, cre these creation annihilation oper operators in it. And uh, with that, we have our solution in the second quantized language. So open up for questions. So today my contribution to talking about the time dependent uh, perturbation theory is introducing you to thermal equilibrium states. And so I'm going to be talking about density of states and uh, projecting the occupancy of states. So we'll start with the density. Start with the density of uh, photon modes in a cubic cavity. So we have some cube that minus L, volume can be B, or and so we'll start with the generic uh, waveform function where it's e to the negative i k r for r is just our coordinates. And we're going to impose the boundary condition that every two pi we have to get the same value. So that gets us to k equals two pi and a rel. And then we have um, products where all of the different coordinates or k's depends just from the other be capital K, capital N. And so getting to the next function, we are trying to solve for dn because density of states would be the amount of states per energy. So we need to rearrange this to get dn equals uh, L over two pi cubed uh, times dk. And talking about photons with Cartesian coordinates is kind of difficult. So it's easier to just convert into this angle. So this angle is actually the projection of k. So we multiply or we replace dk with this factor to get it in polar coordinates. And then we need to substitute k for omega over c, which is just frequency. Um, I don't remember where that comes from exactly, but either way, we replace that and then we end up with this function. And then as we know, density of states is dn over de. So we just divide by de, this factor. And for a photon, our energy is h bar omega and we have de. So we need the derivative of that, which is h bar d omega. So d omega cancels and we end up with this next function. And so you could use this for a Fermi's golden rule, which you need the state density. And that would be, well, moving on to a slightly different topic. We're talking about partition function for individual uh, systems or individual molecules. So uh, if we're talking about harmonic oscillator, our energy is 2n plus 1 over 2 h bar omega. And this is where we use the Boltzmann factor. 
So we have all of our different states, and so we need to find the probability of those states. Let's say state J, and we want to know how likely it is to be occupied. And we get this nice Boltzmann factor function, but it's unnormalized. And to normalize it, we'll divide it by the Boltzmann factor, or the partition function, which is just the sum of Boltzmann factor in every possible state. And we get this probability, normalized probability. And if we're talking about harmonic oscillator, we can just substitute in our engineering function to this to get our one and a half, three halves, five halves, so on. But that's only for a single particle or a single molecule. If we're talking about an ensemble, we need to know whether they're distinguishable or indistinguishable. Typically, most systems are indistinguishable because it's hard to tell two particles apart. And so we'll start with the less useful one, which is distinguishable, which it all comes down to the partition function being the product of every partition function of every molecule. But if they're indistinguishable, which is more common, we need to account for overcounting, where let's say every particle is in ground or it's in excited state one, but one of them is in excited state zero. We can't tell if these two particles are switching, if they're like exchanging places, or if they're actually changing their energy levels. So we need to account for overcounting by dividing by n factorial. And applying this to quantum mechanics, we use the density matrix. But no, that's right. Oh, did it? So then we can use the density matrix to apply um, uh, statistical thermodynamics principles to uh, quantum mechanics. So there's two things. We have pure states and mixed states. Mixed states is what we think of for a large ensemble of systems where all our states are mixed. It's kind of hard to tell them apart. But for a quantum system, we usually have one particle that's in a definite system. With mixed states, you can't really tell what it definitely is, so it's more probabilities. So we'll start with our system. We'll just call it A, and it's made of some eigenvectors and cofactors, which we can consider that just a sum, where I is just our index of our different uh, eigenvectors. So if we're trying to figure out the probability, again, we'll bring out the Boltzmann factor. So multiply everything by the Boltzmann factor. We get energy of our state A and the energy of each individual eigenvector. And this looks very similar to our partition function, um, the little case Q. And so this is just Q. If it's distinguishable, we'll call it Q. If it's indistinguishable, we have to include that n factorial, which is now multiplied by the first variant of the function. But more or less, this is a good way to relate um, quantum mechanical ideas to that partition function. And so our density matrix operator, it's defined as this function. But again, that could be replaced with partition function. And so the eigenvalues, they or the eigenvalues of the density matrix will get you the probability of some eigenvector being occupied or some eigenstate of our overall state. And uh, that's it. So if anyone has any questions. Um so I will be speaking about the black body radiation. So, so the black body radiation describes the relationship between um, an object's temperature and the wavelength of electromagnetic radiation that it emits. Um, the term black body is actually an idealized object that absorbs all electromagnetic radiation that it comes in contact with. So um, this black body absorbs the radiations that is incident upon it, and it actually radiates its <clears throat> at a specific um, spectrum. And this is dependent solely on the temperature of the um, object. Um, it doesn't depend on the type of radiation or the type of material itself. So to just put it simply, um, black body radiation refers to um, spectrum of light emitted by any heated objects, for example, um, the filament and light bulb. So application of um, black body radiation would be with the case of um, incandescent light bulb, 
and like solar collectors in solar energy conversion cells. <clears throat> So I will be talking about the laws that govern um, the laws that govern um, black body radiation. Um, first is um, Planck's radiation law, and um, it actually defines um, spectral radiance of electromagnetic radiation emitted by a black body. Um, <clears throat> so this spectral rad radiance is what is denoted by B, subscript V, and it can be expressed either in terms of frequency or um, wavelength. So we're here, um, KB is the Boltzmann constant and um, T is temperature. So with the um, Planck's radiation law, it gives a distribution that sort of like peaks at a certain um, wavelength. And then this peak shifts to um, shorter, shorter wavelengths when it's at higher um, temperature. So the figure there shows for both um, wavelength and frequency. Um, Planck's radiation law is actually a quantum mechanical law um, that is based off of one of the classical laws, which I was speaking about next, is the Rayleigh genes law. And um, it's an approximation to the spectral radiance, as I explained earlier, um, with the Planck's, Planck's radiation. Um, Planck's radiation law, and um, it, express, it expresses this um, spectral radiance as a function of um, the fourth power of um, wavelength. So um, in the limits of low frequency, the Planck's law, like I explained earlier, actually tends to um, really genes. It works for longer um, wavelengths, lower frequency. But the moment it begins to approach smaller wavelengths, uh, yeah, smaller wavelengths, then what happens is the ultraviolet catastrophe. Like from the uh, so, like if you see here, um, it was. Like it was okay at the longer wavelength, but then when it got to the shorter wavelength, it just kicks off. That's because of the ultraviolet catastrophe. It just doesn't work for um, lower wavelengths. But when it comes to um, lower wavelengths and higher um, frequencies, then the Wayne displacement law actually works um, for this. So this um, Wayne displacement law um, actually shows um, the black body radiation curve. Um, it shows that the wavelength is inversely proportional to um, temperature, where B here is known as the Wayne's displacement constant. So for this um, Wayne displacement um, law, it shows the black body radiation curve. That's the um, figure at the bottom. It shows the uh, it shows this for like different temperature. It will peak at different um, wavelengths, which are inversely proportional to um, temperature. So um, another law um, about this. Um, Black body radiation is the Stefan Boltzmann law, and it actually describes the um, intensity of black body radiation as a function of temperature. So it takes the total energy here, which is J, and it's proportional to the fourth power of the absolute um, 
temperature. So you can see the curve is kind of like an exponential curve. That's all. Okay, please join me in the second one. So what I am going to discuss with you today is Einstein's coefficients, and we're going to start with a brief introduction to spontaneous and simulated emission processes. So the spontaneous emission process is um, one that you probably think about re relatively simply. It ejects a photon and relaxes from an excited state to a ground state, um, where stimulated emission it does the same idea, but it's due to incident <clears throat> light in the area causing the relaxation to happen. And absorption is the reverse of the stimulated emission. So in, instead of emitting a photon and dropping from excited to a ground state, it absorbs a photon and moves from a ground to an excited state. So then we can write simple rate laws for these. So we have our change in our states, and this is an old PowerPoint. So the way the terms I have is the lower state is one, the higher state is two. So we have these constants here, these A's and B's. These are what is called the Einstein coefficients. I think that's all I have in this slide. This is an old one, and it's, it's I ha got rid of this animation and the new one, but whatever. So we have our perturbing Hamiltonian here, and if you go through and do solve for the time dependence Schrodinger equation, you can get out your probability of transition. So what this one is is this is the transition for polarized light. Um, so if we were to draw our EM on a axis, we would be looking at, at it going along one direction, and you would get this. Um, but what we need is we need to solve it, figure it out for unpolarized light. So where this one has this P squared term, which is the, uh, the dipole. Transition, the transition dipole. Um, we need for the non-polarized, we need to have, we need to factor it in over this term. Um, so what this does is it deals with the all the unpolarized light and N is the polarization here. Um, so if we were to, so what this ends up working out to is I don't off the top of my head remember. So there's a cosine term in here, and a I believe it's this. If I remember, there's some co constants in front of the in front of the cosine. So what it is is we have that. This would be P, and this would be theta. So then we would have an integral in front of here going over that range, and then it reduces down. And we, once we solve for the integral, we end up with this equation. And I looks like I completely lost my discussion on the rate. <laughs> um, so this term is actually a rate, not a probability. So it should have an R instead of P. Um, so for this, we have um, we're looking at it in, in thermal equilibrium now. So we have this first law, which is showing the change in rate of the excited state. And because we're in a thermal equilibrium, 
the cha it should not change. So we set these numbers equal to zero. And then we solve for this, the energy, energy density, which we get here, uh, applying both uh, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, we can move, convert to this one. And then if we compare this result to the Planck's laws of black body emission that Lola showed us, we can actually solve for these values of A and B. And I have them right here and another equation that got lost. Is that so the stimulated emission and the stimulated absorption are equal to each other with the factor of degeneracy? That's what G is. G is degeneracy of the states. Um, so what this this lets us actually solve for our Einstein coefficients, and then. If we were to, just as a simple exercise, we can compare this to Fermi's golden rule. And we see if we use the term here, it has a very similar structure to Fermi's golden rule. In fact, it has basically the identical structure where P has this form. Um, and we see that same thing here, except here it's the entire Hamiltonian. And then we also have a density and that's what i have on this one um 